Well, Dalal Street gains for the 12th straight day its longest winning streak in over three decades. The Nifty and the Sensex gain for the third straight week its biggest weekly gain in two months. Over the next 30 minutes, we decode the week on Dalal Street, put the spotlight on NSE's plans to go public and we'll tell you all about the big block deals this week. Hello and welcome to the Editor's Roundtable. I'm Sonia Shanoi with me, Nimesha and Nigel D'Souza. Also on the show today with us is Devina Mehra, the Founder, Chairperson and Managing Director at First Global. Uh, well, guys, uh, before we go across to Devina, what a week it's been for yeah. the market, right? I mean, phenomenal the kind of run-up. At every point in time, one would have expected a, a sell-off to come through, but it just didn't. So I think it's been spectacular. Well, that's right. You know, when you have five sessions in a week and all five end in the green, that's telling you that, yeah. in fact, it was a good day. And, you know, it was a more large cap driven. So uh, it was good. But I, I like the point that Nimesh made actually uh, towards the end of Friday. When we're expecting the entire MSA rejig to take place, and we're talking about $5 billion exactly. and the market's end up 50, 60 fly. points. Exactly. So, so yeah. no, that, that also says that, uh, as, as you rightly pointed out, Sonia, at the introduction, that we had uh, 12 days of uh, you know uh, straight uh, straight gains without any any fall it looks like there is a bit of anticipation of this big msci inflow and that's the reason why market didn't fell in the last 12 12 sessions 12 or 12, 11 or 12 sessions so looks like a bit of preempt was done now it will be all about what for the for the september series we have this big fed uh, you know fed meet that can be a big trigger for the markets in fact nigel is going to put a piece as well as to what rate cut means for global and emerging markets that's an interesting data to watch actually but in general, you know, it's today, it, this market is all about liquidity, right? There is so much of domestic liquidity which is helping the markets, especially the bulls, to just carry on and and just you know ride without any fear. So I guess some some data needs to be looked at very closely now. Earnings were not that great. Uh, we'll have to see how you know the Fed Fed as in when what how much it, how much they do. The U.S. elections in November will be quite uh, tricky as well. So Correct. a lot of uh, you know forward future looking data is suggesting <coughs> a bit of caution, but. Uh, who are we to fight the liquidity? No, actually, there are some ominous signs of a correction in the global markets, right? Yeah. There is talks of a recession in the US. The data that has come out, whether it's the unemployment rate that has gone up, there's stagflation concerns in the US as well. So, a correction, global correction is imminent. But mm. the timing of when it happens, no one can tell. <laughs> but, Nigel, you, you know, uh, sort of analyze the market through the week. Yeah, well, that's right. <clears throat> you know, for the time being, the markets want to ignore any kind of, uh, yeah. you know, Negative. bad news and just want to pick up the good news and just move ahead. So the global market's well in blue sky territory. We are back at all-time highs. At the start of uh, August, everyone said, hey, what's going on? You know, are we going to see that big correction? And the US markets as well corrected. But we picked up from then. In August itself, we're up more than 4.5%, which is telling you the kind of move that we're seeing. So global markets, well, we're awaiting that Fed rate cut so, uh, in September itself. Now it's between 25 basis points or 50 basis points, but the street has digested that, yes, we're going to see uh, rate cuts uh, that will come in. Indian markets, well, we make fresh all-time highs, but there are pockets where we are seeing some bit of selling, and now we're on a 12-session winning streak. Geopolitical t issues, you know, that's being ignored for now, but that could be something that will come to fore, particularly when we have the U.S. elections as expected in the next two months uh, or so. For me, the Nifty Bank not able to conquer that 51,400 mark, that's a bit of a worrying sign because almost every day in this week we went to 51,400, but we couldn't get past that. That's where the 50 DMA is as well. So I think once we get decisively past that, then that's what will give direction. Or maybe we break the, 50 DMA, uh, the 20 DMA on the Nifty Bank on the downside, which is around 400 points away from current levels. What did well this week? Two opposite ends of the spectrum. Tech did well, we're up 4% over there, and Realty was up closer on 3.5%. Both those two indices, the big outperformers. But the broader markets, a bit of an underperformance. You know, one more point, guys. Uh, everyone's saying we're not seeing a big correction. Everything is at all-time highs. NVIDIA, the stock is up 140% yeah. in this year itself. From the peak, it's down 16%. You know, quietly, that one's corrected. Defense stocks, HAL, exactly. correct. Bharat Dynamics, yeah. both of them have corrected big time from the yeah. recent from peak. The peak right. So yeah. there are, though we are saying that the markets have not corrected, but individual stocks are going through 15, 20, 25 percent correction so as well. Nigel, Absolutely. that's exactly the point. You know, this week, it may, it may look good that the, you know, it's a 12 day of uh, winning streak or whatever. But if you, for this week uh, particularly, it's the large cap which have done well. Yeah. The broader market stocks have not done that well. There are some pockets which have done well, but that's again, you know, very limited stock which have done well. So. If you ask a portfolio investor, he will not be happy with this, this week's performance, especially from a portfolio point of view. The Nifty looks great uh, because of, and we've, we've seen this, right? At, uh, after an, after an all-time of 25,000, generally we are going to see the large caps to drive this. So we had the big HDFC event, that is now out of the way. We had a Reliance event this week, even that is out of, out mm -hmm. of the way. Uh, tech has rallied 20-25% from the, from the recent low. So now we need to focus on which, which sector or which 
leader in the large cap which can take this rally for, you know forward Absolutely. so i guess that's going to be a big question mark maybe one of the sectors to watch could be uh, metals because again there is a there is a talk of a stimulus in china so mm. that could lead to a bit of a rally in the metal <coughs> name but i guess uh, there are not enough levers now even the in the market. large caps which can you know potentially throw up a lot big surprise so need to see how it goes in fact i just want to get devina's view into this uh, she's been sitting by waiting patiently devina thank you so much for joining us so you know as we were discussing right i mean there are signs and perhaps a correction is overdue as well but it hasn't come yet so as an indian market investor what do you do now do you get cautious do you raise your cash levels or do you continue to ride this rally and uh, hi and good afternoon to you and your viewers uh, uh, if you wanted in one line i would say get out of the frothy areas of the market and get into a steadier portfolio you need not go into cash necessarily uh, but there have been pockets in the market which all of us know of where there have been excesses whether it is in market cap categories whether it is in themes whether it is in uh new offerings whether of stocks or of funds i would say even these some of the nfos in the areas where they have come up so those are the areas where you should take some money off the table and put it in in a steadier portfolio that would be the, my number one advice so okay. devina um, uh, when you say steadier portfolio if you can just tell for our viewers which are the sectors that you are quite bullish on at this point in time and would like to incrementally add money into into those sectors Uh, in july we did a we, we do a quarterly rebalance of our pms portfolio so from base zero where would we be if uh, we had money uh, today if we had uh, uh, cash today and uh, so there are some some themes which continued so we have been overweight uh, for example in auto then pharma for the past year and a half in the beginning of 23 we added more there auto components in particular more than autos and pharma um, capital goods and industrial machinery we got in much earlier than most other funds and uh, investors which is almost 3 years ago in october 21 we have been cutting and booking profits but we are still a little overweight a uh, sector which we went we were slightly overweight we went even more overweight in the last rebalance was it uh, and uh, a sector which had kind of disappeared from our portfolios for almost 2 years was chemicals and that made a comeback in our systems a number of chemical stocks uh, went up high so that's a sector uh, where we made fresh investments uh, we remain where we are underweight we remain underweight banks uh, but the change of late in the last two quarters has been that we moved a little from the psus to the private sector still underweight but the relative weights changed surprisingly this time uh, a lot of the other non lending financials our systems did not like for example stock exchanges or amcs or uh, you know broking related stocks so we uh, you know, it just because they they fell so much in our uh, rankings uh, we got out of most of that so that would be the broad pattern of what we did this time where we are overweight where we are underweight we are quite a bit underweight uh, things like energy utilities and things like that so that's one more segment All right, uh, Devina. Well, I'll tell you what. Everyone's talking about this 12 straight winning streak, but the bulls will be hoping that history doesn't repeat itself. Because in the last 12 sessions, the Nifty has ended well in the green, which is great news, right? When was the last time that we had a 12 session winning streak? It was all the way back in November 1993. You know, the markets went up by around 139 points on a base of around 800. and that's why the gains are around 17% the last time around we saw 12 straight sessions that we did have gains this time around because of the larger base it's at around 4 and a half percent or but i'll tell you what that's a long time away so let's figure out when did we at least see a 11 session winning streak well that was a long long time away in fact it was in 2007 uh, itself and at that point of time we had a good run you know the markets were up by around 700 points approximately uh, in the in 11 straight sessions Three months later, we were even higher. So after jumping up closer than sixteen percent, we built on another eighteen percent. But from then on, you know things actually went southward. So post that eleven session winning streak, six months down the line, we had corrected by eight and a half percent from there. And one year down the line, we corrected closer on twenty-seven percent. So it's been a good run, twelve session winning streak. The bulls are feeling good, but they are hoping that history doesn't repeat itself because when we last had a eleven session winning streak, well a year down the line. things didn't look very very good 
Well, Devina, I wanted your view on this. You know, we keep talking about the majority of the Indian investors. We keep talking about the domestic flows have been rock solid. Uh, I, I, are we getting a little too comfortable? Because if you dissect those flow numbers as well, you know, it throws up various results. What's your view, uh, Devina? 2007, 2008, that was when I started tracking markets. But you all would vividly remember that, uh, that uh, period. Tell us more. Yeah, so let me go back even further. You, you gave that 1993 example. So yes, there was a lot of market movement around that time. But you must remember uh, that from 1994, which interestingly is also the time that the FII flows into India came, started in earnest. There was a whole nine-year streak from 94 to 2003 when the net movement in the market was zero. I mean, there was it went up and it went down, but ultimately over nine years, the index uh, was uh, index movement was zero over nine years. And this, I mean, for all the people who track flows, uh, this is also important to remember that with this fresh slew of FII money coming in, no mutual fund market, uh, you know, to speak of in India, no very little retail participation, still it didn't move the market. But this is the, you know, the, the, the postscript to that is this, that after that nine year of no, no net displacement from 2003 to 2007, uh, the market went up six times, which was also part of a general emerging market move because the emerging market index itself went up three and a half times, Brazil went up 10 times and so on, at a time when US was struggling. So, uh, so the, that was the move that 2003 to seven, it was a six times move for the index. So yes, after that it fell, but then you know this also gives you perspective as to how movements can happen. And as this is a statistic I've quoted earlier in my interviews also with you, that 2010 to 20 was again a period while, you know, it's not as if there were zero returns, but there were very low returns. There were returns which were barely matching fixed deposit returns. So if you had put in 100 rupees at the beginning of the decade at 2010 and 11, you would have made only 230 rupees at the end of 10 years. As against 1980, you put in 100 rupees, that went to 700 rupees. So this was what created this subnormal return for a whole decade, uh, just about you know not even 9% at a time when fixed deposit rates were 8%. That created the room for this bull run, which is why I'm saying that for the for the large gap for the mainstream indexes, I am still not negative on a sustained basis. There can be interim sure. volatility, but I don't think we are at the high end. So, you know, that 2007 and 93, there's a context to it. So 2007 was after a six times move in, in uh, about six years. So correct, correct. You know, that, that was a context. Okay. Uh, Devina, we'll just come back to you. You know, you were making a very good point about some of these uh, exchanges and, you know, how they've been doing as well. Uh, the National Stock Exchange has revived its IPO plans and everyone has their eye on it. Nimesh, you have all the details? Yes, so, you know, Sonia, uh, as you rightly pointed out, everybody's waiting for this NSC IPO. It's going to be a big mega blockbuster IPO as and when it happens. Of course, there are a lot of regulatory challenges to it. But uh, this week, uh, the board of uh, NSC has, had actually asked, you know, to file a fresh NOC. Uh, not a, a certificate from uh, from regulator SEBI to file for a fresh IPO. Remember, in 2016 they tried, and uh, and and it's it's still not been you know cleared by the by the regulator. So again, it's a it's a as I said, it's a big event to track, and of course there is a lot of interest from retail investors as well. Inter uh, interestingly, last quarter the exchange also announced a bonus in the ratio of one is to four. So uh, again, that's that's uh, still waiting. This SEBI not now uh, IFL uh, has put out an interesting note on NSE this week. And they believe that, uh, you know, the kind of uh, speculative volume which has gone up in the options market, NSC faces a lot of uncertainty, largely from a regulatory point of view. So there, there has been a lot of consultation and, 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 and there is an expectation that SEBI will come out with some regulations to control the speculation in the uh, FNO market. Now, NSC, uh, IFL believes that if there, if there are stringent norms and stringent restrictions on, on the trading volumes, it can impact one third of the NSC's volume, which would mean that the FY26 EPS can go down by 20 to 25 percent. So that's the kind of fit NSE can take in the near term if indeed that has to happen. Additionally, uh, there was a recent uh, announcement that uh, so regulator had asked NSE to provide further 2,600 crores in the, uh, so, so in the guarantee fund. So that also can have an impact of close to 5 percent on the earnings as per the IFL note. But uh, interestingly, I've heard only today there was, a, there was a feedback that there is a fresh block 
uh, on NSC at an average price of 5,300 rupees per share. So if you look at uh, from a valuation point of view where NSC stands vis-a-vis -vis the other uh, exchange peers, NSC on uh, FY26 price to earning is still quoting at close to 19 times, whereas BSC is already at 31, MCX is at 44, and IEX is trading at close to 40 times. So NSC is still very cheap uh, compared to the other listed peers, largely because it's unlisted so far. But uh, the other interesting thing, indeed, if, if it has to happen that NSC gets listed, of course, it has to get listed on the BSC. I just looked at some data on, on, on BSC 30. Uh, at the current price of 5,300, uh, the market cap uh, that NSC will come on will be close to 2.6 lakh crore. Right now, uh, it would stand around 25th company in the BSC ranking. Uh, interestingly, Nestle currently is having a market cap of close to 2.4 lakh crore. So if, if today, for example, NSC has to list, it will be above, above Nestle for sure as far as the market cap is concerned. So a lot of eyes are definitely on NSC's listing. Of course, there are a lot of regulatory headwinds and needs to check. But uh, IFL believes that if there is a stringent uh, regulator uh, uh, you know, interferences, then the impact on the EPS earnings could be between 20 to 25%. Okay. Uh, Devina, you want to come in on that? Of course, this is something that's long coming. I mean, there are a lot of regulatory issues as well that NSC has been facing. But as and when the listing happens, it's going to be big, especially for shareholders, right? Um, any thoughts on how to approach this one? I haven't really studied the numbers, so I would not like to comment on that. As I told you, this whole category, our systems did not like, and partly the reason could be some amount of regulatory overhang which might change the dynamics. And so I agree that this is a real risk, and as it should be, I mean, because the derivatives volumes, the way if you see over five years or six years, the way it has gone up, it doesn't make any sense. And obviously, everybody is losing money, which they refuse to recognize. And because human beings don't understand probability. So you're essentially playing playing a lottery. And, uh, you know for certain that the expected value of doing this is negative, but you think you will be the exception. So I mean, th those things uh, uh, are there. Overall, I would say in the IPO market, you know, India is a capital-starved economy. So any time any window of capital raising opens, then you know, first the good guys come and then a whole lot of a bunch, a whole bunch comes, which is a mix of good, bad and really ugly. So that's what's going on overall here. I see in the, I mean, not, no, I'm not talking about the NSC IPO, obviously, but this, I think IPOs in general or even fundraising in general, I was looking at the QIP data, you know, QIP uh, raising this year in the first six, seven months has been as much as what it was for the whole of last year, which itself was a big, huge jump over 2022. So anytime there's a capital available, you know, Indian companies probably from the company point of view, rightly so, just go and raise money. I mean, when GDR market, which people have long forgotten, opened in the 90s and so many Indian companies went there as global depository receipts. And I looked at the data, and I found that of the entire global GDR market, it was 90, 95% Indian companies. So, you know, that's that's the danger when there are too many uh, companies raising money. I even hear some analysts saying that, look, uh, so-and-so is doing a QIP, which is a positive. And, you know, that's not the filter to look at because QIPs typically mean dilution and return ratios, you know, which is yeah. not to say that QIPs never make sense, but I'm just saying that there's too much fundraising going on overall. Yes. Uh, Devila, exactly. You know, that's, that, that's why I wanted to ask the next question to you, uh, especially in the real estate sector. As you rightly pointed out, there are a lot of companies which are raising funds, especially in the real estate names this week. In fact, today itself, we saw two companies uh, you know, raising money via QIP uh, and, and pretty large sum. In fact, the entire uh, you know, real estate basket has raised money or, or in the pipeline of raising money. Uh, your view on the real estate sector stocks, and do it, uh, is there in part of your portfolio right now? No, they are not part of our portfolio, so which is why we are not looking at it very closely. It's a risky sector, and as a philosophy, as a house, and how we manage portfolios, uh, we first try to avoid big risk. So this is not a sector that we have ever held in great size. And you know, given the nature of the sector, I mean, it's no wonder that uh, people are raising money because uh, you know that's the way to do it in, in this uh, in this market that money is available so you may as well raise as much as possible uh, but also i mean in okay all this right. is not really you know based yeah. on 
of data, but purely oh, anecdotally, I, I don't with see your video, the uh, Devina. So I'm I think we're just going to come back to you in a bit. We can't hear you very well. But this was another big week for block deals worth nearly 20,000 crore rupees. Nimesh, take us through the big ones. So, Sonia, the headline is second consecutive week of uh, block deals worth 20,000 crores or almost 18,000 crores this week and we saw 20,000 crores last week as well. So, but the big headline for this week was, of course, uh, the Indigo block. Kanwal sold, uh, uh, you know, stake worth almost 11,000 crores by a block deal and still owns 13 odd percent. Uh, so, that was one large block. PB Fintech, there was a large block, 1,600 crores. Uh, well spent living the promoter sold and raised close to 900 crores nirlon was a large block today but again a small one though but metplus was another large block of close to 850 crores this week and couple of other big names uh, like tata technologies there was a large block uh, of close to 1400 crores and i believe there could be more blocks in tata technologies so these were the large blocks of this week but i guess the big standard was indigo uh, from this week even last week we saw some large block deals zomato ambuja cement kalyan jewelers that's a long list so the big headline is for second consecutive week We've seen large block deals, but uh, my sense is it's not going to end uh, here. In fact, for, for next week, there is a long list of lineup which has already been there. I highlighted about Paytm, there could be a potential large block deal. So, because of this, so much of domestic liquidity and uh, uh, there, is a, there is a lot of uh, selling happening from promoters and from uh, PE investors also. Looks like this trend is going to only continue, uh, at least till the earnings season kicks in. Okay, well, let's do one thing. Let's take a short break on that note. We'll be back with lots more market opinion with Devina on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Editor's Roundtable. Well, we still have Devina Mehra with us, the founder, chairperson and MD at First Global. Uh, Devina, before we let you go, you know, you were telling us about how what your view is on the markets, but if this correction does set in, then any couple of sectors or stocks or, you know, pockets in this market that you think are worth investing into now? Yeah, I told you where we are overweight, which is auto confidence, uh, pharma, uh, a little bit of industrials and uh, capital goods, IT, those are the places where we continue to be overweight. Uh, to a greater or lesser degree. But as I said, be careful. And I was listening to the talk on block deals. That's another area where, you know, aggregate numbers are very high. I'm not one of those who always think that insider uh, selling is bad because obviously if everybody uh, does and should diversify their net worth, it is, it's locked up mostly in one company or yeah. one group. So that's a sensible thing. But on the aggregates, when the numbers are this large, it, it, it it shows uh, froth at least in some areas of the market. Okay. And real estate, I was yeah. saying, anecdotally, I don't find people being able to sell their existing flats at anywhere close to what the numbers are being quoted in the market. <laughs> so, okay. so, got it. <laughs> All right, Devina, we appreciate you joining in on the show. Thanks a lot uh, for joining in, and uh, we look forward to chatting up with you rather soon. But you know, before we wrap up on this editor's roundtable, uh, we uh, say goodbye to Sonia. It's a final editor's roundtable. Well, uh, working with Sonia personally has been absolutely a joy, a thrill, someone who you can always go to over the last many, many years. We're going to miss you, Sonia, but we wish you well. I recall when I joined CNBC TV18, one of the key things that you wanted was to learn from Udayan and work with Sonia. You know, and for, work for with me, Sonia was one thing, Nigel. Yeah. For me, you know, the maximum request which is to come to me, you know, can you introduce to her? Can I have a coffee with her? Absolutely. Fact, you know, I told her once that, you know, Sonia, why don't you start a series where we do a coffee with Sonia? <laughs> so many people will love to pay and come to, you know, see her. So that's the kind of craze she had uh, in the dealing rooms and, and with the market, market participants. Well, I absolutely agree. Well, I, mean, I recall when I joined her, uh, Sonia, can I take a photograph with you? you know, that was, uh, that was so, it. But Sonia, you've been absolutely a thrill to work with. Uh, you know, besides well. markets, uh, a person that you could always go to. Someone who could always, you could always rely on and with a calm mind. Don't get into any controversy. You'll handle it. So all the best. And thank you. Thank you for, uh, for everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I, you know, I'm almost going to shed a tear, but I won't. <laughs> but Nigel, it's been amazing working with you. And Nimesh, I mean, the amount of knowledge that I have got from both of you and from everyone in this team, it's been unparalleled. It's been an amazing journey. And of course, I mean, uh, all good things come to an end. So this has as well, but I'm sure 
if not in front of the camera, behind the scenes, we'll oh, definitely course. catch Absolutely. up. Absolutely. But I think you want to do this one last time on Editor's Roundtable, so go for it, Sonia. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for watching Editor's Roundtable. You guys have a great weekend. And any weekend plans one last time? Uh, not me for this weekend. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Uh, the, you know, the, the week you ask me, I have, I have no plans. And the way I plan something, you don't ask me. So I just end up not uh, revealing my plans. So anyway, when no plans. When next week, someone else is going to ask you a weekend plan, so be ready. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great weekend. Thanks a lot for watching. It's Sonia Shanoi signing out.